もしやコスモではコスモ needs me free コスモ AP ラミデュアリースポーツ Promotional consideration by ATP Turbo The premier provider of turbocharging components Hmm, as I feared, there is not a whole hell of a lot of room for this turbo. So I think before I decide on its final position, I should probably assemble the rest of it so I'm not accidentally creating a clearance problem. I've been buying from ATP Turbo for years, so when I needed a turbo for the Cosmo, I called them up and ordered this. This is a Garrett GT3076R.82 T3 turbine size. A little bit smaller than one would typically use on a 13B, but I'll explain that a bit later. The 3076R is a dual ball bearing design. I chose to go with an internal wastegate, basically for a packaging concern, and the 2.5 inch inlet TO4E style compressor housing. To actuate the internal wastegate, from ATP, I also picked up an 11 psi wastegate actuator, as well as a universal wastegate actuator bracket. Okay, well, to install the wastegate actuator, all I need to do is loosen the bolts that clamp the compressor housing, and then I should be able to move the compressor housing into roughly the position I want it. Traditionally, this is Outlet facing straight up. And the bracket is universal, so it's designed to fit in multiple locations and looks like I want it right there. Okay, the bracket just bolts right on, and obviously I'm going to have to get some longer bolts when I assemble this in its final configuration. Then rotate the compressor housing back down to roughly where I want it. The rod gets screwed onto the actuator.、Uh, there should be a jam nut there, but because this is just mock up, I'm not using it. And it gets slipped in and hooked onto the wastegate. Eventually, this will bolt on, but because this is just mock up, I'm just using the spring tension of the arm. To hold everything in place. So, if I apply a little bit of compressed air, you should see the wastegate work. Wow! It's pretty obvious I'm going to have to lengthen this arm by about a quarter of an inch. It's under a lot of tension, even with the wastegate closed. And the wastegate needs to be able to open a lot more than it is. From ATP Turbo, I also purchased this 5 volt to V band adapter flange. It just mounts to the back of the turbo and adapts the weird five bolt pattern to a more conventional V band pattern. There's actually no gasket between the turbo and this flange because they're precision machine surfaces. Well, it looks like even with all this stuff bolted to it, there's just enough room for the turbo right about here. So, while I think about that, I have a flange to make. Just like the intake manifold flanges, the first step in making this one is to first lay down a template. Now, this is just a template years ago that I made of a 13B exhaust flange because I had to have a bunch years ago cut out on a water jet. I don't have any of those left. I just need one flange. So there's no point in sending out the CAD drawings to the water jet place for one flange. In CAD, I drew little X's in the center of all these holes, which makes it really easy to line up the punch. And just pull off the template. Now it's over to the drill press. Now, this is half inch 304 stainless. So, I'm drilling these holes in very small increments, starting with an eighth inch bit, going slowly, and using plenty of oil.
I'm now enlarging the holes to the next size up, which is a quarter inch. And of course, like most times in life, when you're trying to push something big through a small hole, it's best to go real slow and use lots of lube. I'm building the turbo manifold out of 1.5 inch Schedule 40 304 stainless. Of course, Schedule 40 1.5 inch is actually 1 and 5 8 inch internal diameter. So I picked up a new hole saw that fits the pipe perfectly, and now it's time to hole saw the flange. Nothing like a hole saw through half inch stainless, so I'm clamping everything down really well to make sure it doesn't move around because the bit will grab. Notice that I screwed the stainless plate to a piece of wood. That way I don't damage the uh, uh, drill press deck once the hole saw cuts through. Yep, still lined up. nice set of holes. Time to start cutting the flange into shape and since I have about an inch and a half to lop off the side we're just going to put this vertically in the band saw, turn it on and walk away because it's going to take about 20 minutes to cut through this. could take a while. It's just a matter of using the exhaust gasket to trace out the rest of the shape and then cut it out manually on the bandsaw table, which is going to take damn near forever.
One flange. Probably should have just had that laser cut. Now we'll just pop this on the engine. Now to position the turbo. The time-honored method of positioning a turbocharger in an engine bay is to, of course, hang it by bailing wire. Now, positioning the turbo is actually rather involved because it can't just go where it fits because there's a lot of stuff that has to connect to the turbo. The inlet, the outlet, coolant and uh, oil line, of course the exhaust, the manifold, and then the whole hot side has to be surrounded by a heat shield. So, especially in this engine bay that's really tight around this area, I'm just trying to position it so there's enough room uh, around the rear section uh, for the exhaust and especially an area where I can bring the manifold runners through. So it looks like the front needs to come up just a little bit. Oh. To hold the half-inch stainless ATP Turbo T3 turbo flange in the right spot in the engine bay, I've made this thin plate with two holes that match up to the flange. I'm then sandwiching the plate between the flange and the turbo, and what I'll do is weld the plate to the body of the car, and then screw the flange back to it, and now the flange is in a fixed position without the turbo being in the way. Now, if I can just pick this up without bending everything I just did. Now with my flange mounted in a fixed position and the turbo out of the way, I can begin running the tubing from the exhaust manifold flange to the turbo flange. I'm starting the manifold plumbing at the flange, which kind of involves fitting two round pegs into a rectangular hole. So what I'm going to do is cut a notch on each piece of pipe, then I should be able to fit them together at an angle, heat it up, and then form it into the correct shape. for this, but you know what? The grind is faster and safer on the fingers. Huh. Well, that fits pretty well, considering I did almost no measuring and cut by eye.
now is heating up the pipe so that I can pound it flat so that I can make it fit the relatively rectangular turbo flange. Getting there. Yeah, yeah, I know, I should probably have a bigger torch. But for the once a year, maybe once every two years that I actually use this thing, it does the job. And it's not economical to keep a huge bottle of acetylene and oxygen around for such occasional use. Actually, normally, I just heat things up with the TIG welder, but I wanted to go old school on this. Not too bad. It's about 92% of the way there, and I think I can get remaining 8% by cold squeezing it with the vise. Yep, that's about 95%. Five more to go. Well, hell, I'd say that's pretty good.
the bevel I just ground matches up with the bevel on the pipe elves and when assembled together provide somewhere for the weld to penetrate into. Now once this thing is bolted back to the jig I can start laying some pipe. Building one of these manifolds, especially in this case where it has to sneak through a lot of tight areas, kind of involves just laying on your back for at least an hour, holding up various lengths of pipe and bends, trying to figure out how everything's going to lay out. What I'm trying to do is keep the manifold as elegant and straightforward as possible without creating very difficult and convoluted bends. This whole process really messes with your brain because you're working in four dimensions. Not just X, Y, and Z, but the fourth dimension is time. And that's how much time you can hold this pipe above your head before it falls and hits you in the eye. Although I think this front runner is just a matter of 190 degree and 145 degree with the right length runner between it. After sleeping on it, and in the past I found that it really does help to sleep on it because your, your subconscious uh, works on it while you're dreaming. Uh, what? You don't dream of laying pipe? Um, after sleeping on it, I've uh, figured out that I think I can do the rear runner just by using a 45, a short section of straight pipe, and then I'll just have to trim this 90 a little bit to uh, line up with the uh, hole in the flange. Now that I roughly know the way I'm laying this out, I can start cutting pipe. So. Since the first 45 degree bend is uncut, I'm just taping it in place with some green painter's tape. This is really sticky tape, but it also peels off easily and doesn't leave any residue that will affect the welding. Works really well to hold this stuff in place. I'm guessing that my straight section needs to be about half an inch less than this piece of aluminum uh, pipe that I've been using to mock up. So call it about five inches. Eh, about five inches. It looks like my next piece is going to be a 90 and I'll have to trim just a little bit off of it. Have I ever mentioned how glad I am that my bandsaw has this built-in seat? These pieces are cast, so the wall thickness isn't uniform throughout. And when you cut one in half, sometimes the hole it leaves isn't quite regular. So I'm just evening it out with the die grinder. Wow, it actually looks like this is going to line up reasonably well on the first try. Worst case is I have to cut one of these maybe a quarter inch longer. So. That is exactly five and a half centimeters for my next piece. Well, that's pretty damn close, but as I suspected, this piece needs to just be a little bit longer. And it looks like the whole thing has to rotate that way a little.
Now that I have all my pipes cut to length and angle, I'm going to tack weld many of them off the car because it's just a hell of a lot more fun tacking at the bench than on my back underneath the car. Now that the first runner is firmly tacked in place, I should be able to remove the manifold and work on it in a more convenient location on the bench. I guess the only question is whether or not, once I undo these bolts, if I'll be able to actually get the thing off of the car with this jig in the way. I think that answers my question. Man, that's a tight fit. Now that it's on the bench, it's going to be a hell of a lot easier to work with. So, as I was able to sort of show from underneath the car, the second runner is going to be pretty straightforward. Just a matter of 190, one straight section of pipe, and then another 45. And I just have to shorten the length of this to bring this closer to the hole, which at the same time will also raise it up. So, because remember, it's, it's two angles. You know, it's a combination of a, of a horizontal to bring it this way, but then as you shorten that up, it's vertical, so you also bring it up. Um, so what I'll have to do is just put a little section uh, under there. I made a wide-ass guess and chose 11 centimeters as my runner length. So we'll see how close that is. Well, it seems my guess was pretty close. Now I just need to cut about an inch of runner for here and maybe another three-quarter inch on the bottom. It helps a lot when you're doing this to cut bits of pipe to various lengths. That way you can try different combinations and make substitutions very easily without constantly running back and forth to the saw. I think what I need to do is take about half a centimeter off of this runner here because it is really close to lining up right here and just a hair more off of it will probably put me right where I want to be. Most bandsaws have this handy little holder for when you're cutting something long like a piece of pipe that wants to tilt up in the clamp. So what I like to do is just use a clamp to hold it in place, then tighten this thing down as much as I can. and remove the clamp 
and that should keep the pipe from angling off the table. Well, after some cutting, it turns out that I didn't need a shorter this piece. What I needed was a longer this piece. So, if I can manage to hold everything up with my hands, uh, oops, that's the wrong one. Okay, so I did need a shorter this piece and a longer this piece. There we go, look how well that lines up. Just needs a little bit of filing and it can be tacked together. After a few trips back and forth to the grinder, everything fits perfectly. And what I've done is I've just roughly marked the orientation because my grinding isn't perfectly flat, so it helps to know where things were in mock-up when I start tacking it. Now before I start tacking these things together, of course I have to grind some bevels for the final weld to sit in. One by one, I'm lining up and tacking the small pieces on. And once the small pieces are in place and the tack well have moved things around a little bit, I'll put it back on the manifold and make sure everything fits before I start tacking in the big pieces. Stainless moves a lot, so any time there's any welding done, the fitment needs to be checked again. But it looks like everything fits just as well as it did before the first few tacks, so I can tack the rest. Now this is where it really, really helps to have another person. Notice how I always tack in four places. That just keeps the welds from rocking back and forth as I weld other areas. Stainless steel moves a lot when you weld it because of the shrinkage factor. And it's best to tack solidly. That way I don't end up with a manifold that's more than a few millimeters off when it's finally welded. Now that she's all tacked up and self-supporting, I think it's time for a test fit on the car. While I'm wrestling this thing back on, let's talk a little bit about turbo sizing. Now I mentioned that the GT3076 that I'm using is a .82 T3 turbine, which is normally much smaller than you would typically run on a 13V. On the average 13V, you'd probably want to be T4.90 at the smallest, depending of course on turbine trim. But the reason I've gone so small with my 3076R is because unlike the typical RX-7 build, I'm not trying to carry all the power throughout the entire power band. What I'm trying to do is emphasize the low and mid range. 
But with the smaller turbine housing, all of that wonderful rotary exhaust energy is funneled through a much smaller area onto the turbine wheel, increasing the velocity and force with which it hits that wheel, driving the turbine wheel harder, and thus bringing boost on at a lower RPM. The only disadvantage is that it's going to become a restriction in the upper RPM range, but for my application, that's not really important. Well, she fits, but it's far from hot dog in a hallway type fit. However, that's not a big deal because I have to do a bunch of metal repair on the frame in this area anyway, and I'll just make a note of it now so I can do a slight frame notch and provide enough clearance for the heat shields that have to go around these runners. Of course, I can't resist bolting the turbo on and seeing what she'll look like self-supported on the engine. The tacks in the manifold are strong enough that they should be able to support it. Not bad at all. So this thing's ready to finish well but there's one task I have to do before I start, and that is to make two flanges out of half-inch steel, one that bolts to the engine side and one that bolts to the turbo side. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is that the thick steel will support the stainless steel flange once bolted in place so that the welding heat doesn't warp this flange. It's still good to warp a little, but it's going to be a lot less work for the machinist if it's only out half a millimeter instead of the first time I did this without a supporting flange where it warped like a sixteenth or eighth of an inch. It was brutal. And the second reason is to facilitate the back purge. Now, a back purge just isn't something that your girlfriend does after a night she'll be ashamed of. What I'm referring to is filling the entire manifold with argon gas to displace the oxygen that would normally be inside these tubes. The reason you need to do this is while the outside of the well is shielded by the argon from the TIG torch, inside the tubing is oxygen. And when oxygen hits melted stainless steel, like would occur in a well, it causes it to oxidize. It separates out and forms what we like to call sugaring, which is the stainless steel oxide on the inside of the well. The problem with that is that it causes a brittle spot. So if it's going to crack, that's where it's going to crack. By displacing all of the ox oxygen in the tubes with a constant flow of argon, we can prevent that. Now my plan is to close both ends of the manifold off with those two plates, and on the top plate, just drill a hole and feed the argon in via a tube, and then on the bottom plate, drill two matching holes to allow the oxygen to slowly flow out. This is the first time I've back purged something, so we'll see how that plan works. My back purge rig is really simple. I just took the regulator off of the MIG welder and connected it to my spare argon bottle and then using a few plumbing fittings connected it to some half inch clear tubing which comes up to a valve so I can turn it on and off and then follows around is held in place by my workbench devil chick all the way over to the flange for the turbo side of the manifold and a simple half inch nipple with a quarter inch MPT thread connects it. The horrible mild steel MIG welds are now gone, so before I clean it off with the wire brush to weld, it gets a wipe down with acetone to remove all the marker marks, the labels that came from the factory on the pipe, any gunk that's accumulated, etc., etc., etc. Well, finally, we can get to welding. 
but just as soon as I bolt these flanges on first. Now the joints in the pipe need to all be sealed off by tape so that the purge gas doesn't leak out. And then as they're welded, I'll uncover each joint. Apparently, uh, the best tape to use is this green painter's tape because even if it gets warm, it doesn't leave a residue. I'm purposely leaving this joint here untaped so that there's somewhere for the air to spill out. Because remember, argon is heavier than air. It's going to fill these runners from the bottom up. Before I began welding, I back purged the manifold for about 2 minutes at approximately 10 CFH just to remove all the oxygen from inside the runners. Then I turned the flow down to about 3 to 4 CFH just to keep the gas flowing and to keep a minor pressure inside the manifold. I have the welding current set to about 120 amps and I'm using most of that current to start the weld. Then as the material warms up I'm backing off the pedal a little bit to maintain my welding current at about 80 to 90 amps as to not overheat the material. Welding stainless is a delicate balancing act between getting good penetration and overheating the material. If you overheat a stainless weld, you're going to boil out the nickel and chrome, which is going to cause you all kinds of issues because, well, without the nickel and chrome, it's not really stainless anymore. about two and a half hours behind the torch, she's all done. And she's pretty hot. It's going to take about two more hours for it to cool down. The manifold has now totally cooled, so it's time to pull off these plates. I'm actually quite surprised at how well my little back purging scheme worked, because these welds came out really well. Now I'm not sure how well you can see that, but looking down the runner, those welds look almost ideal. The other runner looks just as good. 
good pipe alignment and about 90% penetration, which means a smooth interior. And everyone loves the beautiful rainbow color of a well done stainless weld. It appears the plates did their job. I don't see any significant warpage here. In fact, I'd say it's perfectly flat. The engine side didn't stay quite as flat. Each end has moved up about half a millimeter, so there's still going to be some work for the machine shop. Of course, and I can resist putting it back on the car. About as much as a 13-year-old boy could resist free internet porn. We have turbo, but there's still a little bit of work to do on this manifold. Of course, I want a smooth transition from the engine into the manifold, so that means port matching the manifold a little bit to the size of the ports on the engine. Grinding stainless sucks, so this might be a while. Well, that's one side. Now the other side. Thankfully, off camera. Because, of course, there's nothing more interesting than watching me run a grinder. All the turbocharger stuff is obviously a huge heat source within the engine bay, especially with the high EGTs of the rotary. So, all the turbocharger related components are going to need heat shields. Now, while I was working on the manifold, I realized that the one and a half inch Schedule 40 pipe I used fits perfectly within two and a half inch tubing. So I think what I'll do is use the two and a half inch tubing to make heat shields for the manifold runners. A really easy way to draw a straight line lengthwise down a piece of tubing is to just hold a piece of angle iron tightly on it. It'll self-align and then you have a perfect line. Looks like my plan will work. Now I'll just mark some bolt holes. I'm just going to weld some nuts to the runner to hold this thing in place. So the next step is to mark my bolt holes, or rather mark my position. And Wow, that's delicate work. At each point of the nut, I'm putting a TIG weld. Problem is, if I screw it up on the last weld and melt some of the threads on the nut, I gotta grind it off and start over again. I need some really short bolts to bolt the heat shield on 
So I have to cut down some longer stainless steel M6 bolts that I had lying around. And now the moment of truth. It's pretty fiddly to get these tiny bolts in, but let's see what I can do. Oh, it's actually pretty easy. Wow. And I am really happy with that. A little bit of trimming here, and then I can work on the other side. Had a little bit of practice now, so welding these nuts on for the bottom of the shield is a little bit less nerve wracking. Aside from the slightly easier welding, it was the exact same procedure for the bottom. So let's bolt that in place. Well that really seemed to work out well. Now obviously the other side is the exact same procedure. So through the magic of editing, the next time you see this thing, the heat shield will be done. I finished the front runner heat shield off camera. So let's put this thing back in the car and make sure she still fits because clearance around this area is kind of tight. I still need to build a heat shield for the turbine housing, but what I'm going to do is wait on that until I have the downpipe in place simply because I'm not sure how things back there are going to line up and look. And I would hate to spend all that time fabricating something out of difficult to work 18 gauge stainless sheet metal only to have to cut it up and modify it when I find out that say a V-band clamp doesn't fit. But it does seem appropriate right now to toss the turbo back on so I can bask in the glory of some promised centrifugal compressor fed forced induction. With that, it looks like we've reached the end of episode 25. First, I'd like to give a huge thanks to ATP Turbo for helping me out on the turbocharger and some of the other stuff that I used in this episode. I've been buying from ATPTurbo.com for years, and you should too. So, what's next for episode 26? Well, I honestly don't know. I'm kind of at a point where I can go several different directions. I can continue on with the rest of the exhaust. Uh, I could loom up this wiring harness. I could peel R15 the uh, floor. I could fix the rotted out frame. Or maybe start working on what I'm going to do with the uh, front subframe and suspension. So, not sure what I'll do. I guess you'll just have to wait and find out.